In this video, we'll walk through an installation of Storage Foundation HA. From the extracted download, run the installer script as a root user. Before we start the installation, let's run the pre-installation check by hitting P. Here, it gives us a choice between VCS and Storage Foundation HA. Let's pick option 2 to install SFHA. This is going to be a 3 node cluster, so I'll go ahead and enter in all 3 host names. The installer requires either SSH or RSH along with a root password. We'll go ahead and use SSH. Now it's going to run the actual pre-installation check. Notice that it's checking for a few different things like compatibility, the platform, free space, and whether or not the nodes are actually able to communicate with each other successfully. So it looks like the pre-installation check passed successfully. It's asking if we want to go ahead and install now, so let's say yes. And yes, we agree to the terms. It's asking which set of packages that we want to install. The default option is recommended, which should be fine for most situations. But notice that the difference in size between recommended and all is only about 25 megs. Unless you're tight on space, you might want to just go ahead and pick the third option. The actual package installation can take a little while. So I'll go ahead and fast forward a bit here. At this point, it'll ask for licensing. If you have license keys, you can enter them here by selecting option 1. If you're running a Veritas Operations Manager server, or VOM, select option 2 for keyless licensing. With keyless licensing, the licensing will actually be managed by the VOM central server once this host has been added to its database. If you just want to evaluate the product, select option 2 and it will be fully functional for 60 days. And we'll do a standard installation. If you want to use Volume Replicator, you could say yes here, otherwise leave it at no. Now it's going to go ahead and register the licenses. Go ahead and say yes to configure SFHA. If you're running a cluster, you'll probably want to enable IO fencing. This is used to prevent what are known as a cluster partition or a split brain. A split brain is something that can occur if the cluster nodes can't communicate with each other, usually due to a problem with the heartbeat network. Basically, if the heartbeat fails, but the cluster nodes are still online, they may both try to take control of the disk simultaneously because the nodes think that the other node is offline. This is a dangerous situation because it can result in data corruption. What fencing does to correct this is, in the event of a partition, it will actually force the nodes in one of the partitions to panic, allowing the other partition to maintain exclusive control of the disks. A panic may not seem like a good thing, but it's better than data cor corruption. If you want, you can run the cluster without fencing, but if you do, you run the risk of cluster partitions and the possibility of data corruption. I don't want to ramble on too long here about fencing, so let's just go ahead and say yes. Now it's going to ask some questions about how we would like to configure the cluster. So the first question is the cluster name. And um, we'll just pick something simple here. LLT is one of the protocols that the cluster nodes use to communicate with each other. Usually you'll want to just pick option 1 for LLT over Ethernet. In newer versions there is the option to encapsulate LLT within UDP for option 2, which may be useful in some environments that don't allow non-standard protocols. However, LLT over Ethernet is usually easiest because it works automatically and you don't have to worry about assigning IP addresses or subnet masks to your heartbeat NICs. Notice that option 3 gives you the option to auto-detect your heartbeats. But I'd like to go ahead and show you the process the old-fashioned way, so let's pick option 1. 
The heartbeat links are networks that are isolated from your public network and are only used for cluster heartbeats. If this is a two-node cluster, you can use crossover cables for the private network. Otherwise, you'll need to use switches. VCS requires a minimum of two heartbeats. In this case, ETH1 and ETH2 are on the private network. You can have more, but a typical configuration is two private heartbeats along with an extra heartbeat on the public network. A public heartbeat is also known as a low priority heartbeat. We'll say yes to this and assign it to ETH5, which is on the public network. What this is asking is if ETH1 on node 1 matches up with ETH1 on nodes 2 and 3. And the same thing with ETH2 and any other private heartbeats that you have. So each cluster has its own unique ID. If you don't feel like thinking of a number, it auto-generates one for you. So 4,935 sounds good to me, so let's go with that. If you have other clusters in your environment, you can run this check to make sure that they aren't using the same cluster ID, which can cause problems with your heartbeats. So this is just a summary of what we've selected so far. It looks good, so let's say yes. Now if you say yes to this, it will create an IP resource for the cluster itself. This is a separate IP from any applications that you will be clustering, and it doesn't have any effect on them either. Believe it or not, a cluster IP is optional, but there are some features like global clustering that do require a cluster IP. We'll go ahead and add one here. Notice that I picked ETH5 because ETH5 is on the public network, and you'll definitely want your IP address to be on the public network. VCS has two main ways of handling security. In secure mode, VCS will use the same usernames and credentials that are used by your system. Non-secure mode just means that VCS maintains its own user accounts and permissions that are separate from your environment. We'll go ahead and pick secure mode. Notice that options 1 and 2 allow you to choose whether or not you want to use the Federal Information Processing Standard. This is a security standard that is required by some government agencies. Whether or not you need it will depend on the security requirements of your organization. VCS allows you to set up email notifications so the cluster will send you alerts for certain events. You can also configure SNMP notifications as well. All right, so in order to run the configuration, the script needs to stop the SFHA processes. Since this is a new setup, that's fine. The configuration process takes a little while, so let's go ahead and fast forward. Alright, so it configured successfully. So now it's going to ask us a few questions about how we want to configure the I.O. fencing. If all of the nodes are physically nearby each other and are connected to the same storage, you can use disk-based fencing. If the nodes are in different physical locations or use different storage, you can use coordination point servers. In this case, this is just a simple cluster where everything is connected to the same storage, so we'll go ahead and pick disk-based fencing. So now it's going to restart VCS again, which is fine. So disk space fencing requires disks that support SCSI 3 persistent reservations. And we need to create a disk group of the fencing disks. So at this point it's just telling us that we don't have any disks initialized yet. So we'll go ahead and let it initialize a few disks for us. Here are the available disks. Fencing requires an odd number of disks and you have to have at least three. So let's go ahead and pick disks 7, 8, and 9, which, because of the way they're enumerated, comes out as 8, 9, and 10. So since we just initialized 7, 8, and 9, we'll go ahead and select those same disks. 
which are available here as the first three disks. And now we'll go ahead and select the new disk group name and we'll call the fencing group Fence GRP. So this is letting us know that there's a utility called VXFEN Test HDW that you can run to verify that the disks can be used as fencing disks. Typically this is something that you would run before using them in a fencing group to make sure that they're safe to use. Since this is just a lab environment, we'll assume that I ran this already and just say yes for now. Now it's going to let you choose the disk policy for fencing. In most cases you'll want to pick DMP, which tells it to use the DMP nodes rather than the raw devices. And it allows fencing disks to support multiple paths to the storage. So now it's going to configure the fencing, so let's go ahead and fast forward again. So if you say yes here, it'll create an additional cluster resource that monitors the status of your I.O. fencing. We'll accept the default group name of VXFEN. If you enable level 2 monitoring, the resource will also monitor the status of the fencing disk group. We'll pick the default of one test for every five monitoring intervals. If you say yes here, it'll upload some details about the installation to Symantec to give the developers a better idea of how people are using the software. And that's it. So this was just a walkthrough of a standard Storage Foundation HA installation and configuration. At this point you would typically need to configure the disk groups and the cluster service groups that are specific to the application that you're going to be clustering.